I invite you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, we're going to begin there. You'll remember that over the last several months that we have been talking about the seven letters to the seven churches, and we said that when we got to the church of Laodicea, we're going to start drilling down into the Laodicean message. And so today we continue that theme. The title of our message is Successful Living at the End of Time. Let's begin with a word of prayer. <sighs> Loving Father, our desire is to have a successful life in Christ as we prepare for your coming. We pray that we would be counted worthy to escape the punishment that's coming upon the world, that we would be able to stand at the brightness of your coming, prepare us for the outpouring of the latter rain. And Lord, our prayer is that you will use us to show the onlooking universe that we can live a successful life in God if we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And we pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start off this morning by asking you the question, what does it mean to be successful, to live a successful life? And I want you to notice, I just went online and I looked at uh, an online dictionary and I want you to notice what it says about success says it, that it is the opposite of failure, that it is the status of having achieved and accomplished an aim or objective. Being successful means the achievement of desired visions and planned goals. Furthermore, success can be a certain social status that describes a prosperous person that could also have gained fame for its favorable outcome. What did you notice there? There were three main things that were described in there that uh, in this author's opinion was success. Social status, financial gain, and fame. Those were the three things that they thought would make a successful life. But what say you? I find it very interesting. Uh, I heard uh, what I think was a very awesome de definition of success a few weeks ago. And that definition was finding out what God wants you to do and doing it. That is a very good biblical definition of success. Finding out what God wants you to do and then doing it. I want you to look with me. You have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 24. And notice in verse 1 it says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to him, showing him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, I want you to put yourself in the place of the disciples for a moment. Imagine as they are showing Jesus the beauty and the, the, the architecture of the temple and the pride and the glory of Israel. And Jesus says, it's all going to be torn down. Imagine what must have been going on inside their minds. And it's no wonder that they came to him when they had a moment, they came to the Mount of Olives, they sat down and they said, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? You can imagine as, as they were contemplating what Jesus was saying, he was saying to them, God's house is going to be destroyed. 
They must have thought this has to be the end of the world. Can you imagine what it was like for the people living in the time of World War I? They must have thought this is surely the end of time. Can you imagine what it was like for those who were living in the time of World War II? They must have thought, surely Jesus is coming quickly. And as we look at the things that are happening in the world today, I don't know about you, but I think we are heading for a major economic collapse. And to me, when the United States of America, the greatest superpower in the world, comes crashing down, it's the end of the world. And so no wonder they come to Jesus and they say to him, tell us, when is this going to happen? What are going to be the signs of it? And I want you to notice here in Matthew 24, I want you to notice the first thing that Jesus says. He says, take heed that no one deceives you. Brothers and sisters, that is the biggest a clue that we can get to what it's going to be like at the end of time right before the coming of Jesus. Make sure no one deceives you. And then notice how he goes on in verse 5. He talks about false Christ and he says, do not be deceived. He goes on and he talks about wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilence and earthquakes and persecution. And he gets down to verse 11 and he talks about false Christ and he says, make sure you're not deceived. And he keeps going on. He talks about the lawlessness, the kingdom of heaven being preached, the great tribulation. He gets down to verse 24 and now he combines the two. There's going to be false Christ and false prophets. And again, he says, don't be deceived. Brothers and sisters, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. This is the greatest instruction that he can give us. And I ask you the question, brothers and sisters, do we have false Christs in the world today? Do we have many people who are teaching error even within the Seventh-day Adventist church, yes or no? Absolutely, we do, don't we? And Jesus says, make sure that no one deceives you. In other words, make sure that you study your Bibles, that you pray, and that you have a successful living at the end of time. And how can we do that? By knowing what God wants us to do and doing it. Amen? I don't know about you, but I am so glad that when Jesus tells us, don't be deceived, don't be deceived, don't be deceived, that he doesn't just stop there. But he actually goes on to tell us how we cannot be deceived or make sure that we're not Deceived. In other words, how we can live successfully at the end of time. If your Bible is like mine, when you get to Matthew chapter 24, I have what's called a red letter edition. Everything that Jesus says is in red letters. And if your Bible's like mine, starting in verse 4, it's all red. And Jesus is speaking here, and I want you to notice that he goes all the way down, not just to chapter 24, end of it, but all the way through chapter 25. In other words, when the original manuscript was written, this was all continuous one statement after another that Jesus is giving. Now, we, we divide this up into chapters so that it's easier to, to study and learn and, and know. But what this should be telling us is that everything that Jesus said after verse 3 is answering the question that the disciples had. Tell us when these things will be, what will be the end of the age, and the sign of your coming. And he's giving the answer, and he starts off saying, don't be 
deceived. And I want you to notice in verse 24, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, who? Even the elect. Now, I, I want you to notice here that there is this major deception that is going on in the world today. In fact, uh, I would suggest to you that the majority of the Christian world does not know who the Antichrist is. They do not know that what is happening in the world today is leading up to a Sunday law. They don't understand that. They don't know that. And so there is this major deception that is going on. And so we read down here and we get to a place where Jesus says, who then, well, let me, let me do this. Let me take you to chapter 25. Chapter 25, and we have three parables in chapter 25. And if this is a continuation of the answer that Jesus is giving in what are the signs of his coming, the end of the age, and so on, then how are these verses going to help us? I, I want you to notice those three parables. And the first thing that I want to ask you is, what is a parable? According to uh, Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, a parable is usually a short story that illustrates a moral attitude or a religious principle. In other words, these three stories are going to help us to understand what Jesus is telling us and how we can make sure that we are not deceived. And so there are these three parables now in Matthew chapter 25. You have the parable of the ten virgins. I love it when Sabbath school lines up perfectly with the message. Amen? And so I appreciated Sabbath school this morning. I thought Noah did a great job with that in talking about those foolish virgins. Then you have the parable of the talents, and then you have the parable of the sheep and goats. Now, normally, when we talk about these parables, we look at them individually, and we drill down into them. We get deep, we drop the blade, and we get into the weeds, if you will, when it comes to these parables. But we normally look at them one at a time when we do that. But today, we are not going to do that. We're not going to drill down into each of these. We're actually going to look at them from a 10,000-foot view, if you will. We're going to look at them uh, from the surface view, but we're going to look at all three of them together, and when you put all three of them together, they paint an amazing picture. They give us uh, some insight into this message that Jesus has for us. So I want you to notice in Matthew 25, look with me in verse 1 and 2. Jesus says, <clears throat> Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. So he starts talking about these virgins. And I want you to notice that... Let me back up for a minute. I want you to notice that when Jesus gave all of those signs of his coming, I want you to notice that after he gives the signs of his coming, the earthquakes, the, the pestilence, the, the wars and rumors of war, the false Christ, the false prophets, he, notice in verse 45 of chapter 24, he says, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them 
food in due season. Now, normally, when we look at the stories of the Bible, we have a tendency in our carnal nature to look at them in a physical sense. You remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus and Jesus said, you must be born again. He said, how can I enter my mother's womb a second time? He was thinking physically, but Jesus was speaking spiritually. When he went to the woman at the well, he said to her, I will give you living water. And she said, how are you going to give me water? You don't even have anything to draw with. But he was talking about spiritual things, right? So if we look Look at this verse, Matthew 24, verse 45, when the faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his house to give them food, spiritual food, they shared the word of God with others, they are a wise servant. They are someone who is living successfully at the end of time. Why? Because they know what God wants them to do, and they are doing it. Amen? And then you get to verse 46, and it says, Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. In other words, they are successful because they know what God wants them to do, and it says they're blessed because they are what? They are doing it. Amen? So now when we look at these ten virgins, it says that uh, the kingdom of heaven is like them, And they took their lamps, and they went out to meet the bridegroom, but five were wise, and five were foolish. And so I ask you the question, when it's talking about a virgin here, who is it talking about? I want you to notice in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 2, it says this, I have likened the daughter of Zion, that's God's people, that's Israel. You and I are spiritual Israel, so it's talking about us. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, the apostle Paul said, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So brothers and sisters, I ask you again, who is it talking about in the parable when it's talking about virgins? It's talking about the church. That's right. It's talking about you and me. Amen. And so uh, we see there in those verses that it's talking about the church. I want you to notice in Christ's object lessons, page 444, it says this, they are called virgins because they profess a pure faith. By the lamps is represented the Word of God. Psalm 119 verse 5 says, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Right? And so when we're looking at the virgins, we're looking at the church, those who profess to be like Christ, those who have uh, surrendered their life to God and have their names written in the book of life. But I want you to notice that even within the church, Five were wise and five were foolish. Amen? Now, look at verse 3. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. In other words, they all had some oil in their lamp, But the wise had an additional vessel that had additional oil with it. I ask you the question, what does the oil represent? The Holy Spirit, that's right. I also want you to notice what else the oil represents. Notice what it says in Bible Echo, May 4, 1896, paragraph 2. There is a world lying in wickedness, in deception, and in delusion, in the very shadow of death, asleep, asleep. Brothers and sisters, does that 
make you think of the condition of the world today. There's this wickedness, there's this deception that's going on, and the, they're in the very shadow of death, and the church is asleep. It goes on to say, who are feeling travail of soul to awaken them. What voice can reach them? My mind is carried to the future when the signal will be given, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. But some will have delayed to obtain the oil for replenishing their lamps, and too late they will find that character, which is represented by the oil, is not transferable. That oil is the righteousness of Christ. It represents character, and character is not transferable. And if you were here in Sabbath school this morning, you heard uh, the discussion on that. No man can secure it for another. Each must obtain for himself a character purified from every stain of sin. The Lord is coming in power and great glory. It will then be his work to make a complete separation between the righteous and the wicked. But the oil cannot then be transferred to the vessels of those who have it not. Then shall be fulfilled the words of Christ, two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. The righteous and the wicked are to be associated together in the work of life, but the Lord reads the character. He discerns who are obedient children who respect and love His commandments. So here we see that the oil not only represents the Holy Spirit, but more importantly, it represents the work of the Holy Spirit in each individual person. And as we surrender and as we allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in us that we can't do in ourselves, then our character is transformed more and more into the image of Christ. And so we have to have the oil. You have to have the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost that spirit nature and the 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 natural man, the human nature, uh, then uh, took over and brought us to the place that we are today. And so we are in great need of the Holy Spirit, and it says that the character cannot be transferred. I can't uh, give you my character. You can't give me your character. We each have to have that character of Christ developed within us, and that requires the Holy Spirit to do that work. And so let me ask you a question then. How is it that the wise had enough oil, but the foolish didn't? Well, we get the answer in the next parable, the parable of the talents. And I'm not going to take the time to read that for you, but let me just paraphrase it. You'll remember that Jesus said that there was a man who was going on a long journey and that was representing himself. He was getting ready to go back to heaven. And it says that he called all of his servants together and he gave them each uh, talents based on their ability. Some had, one had five talents, one was given two, and the other was given one. And I want you to notice that it was based on their ability right? God knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what your skills, talents, abilities are, and he has given to each one according to their ability. And then, of course, we know what happens in the parable. Eventually, the master comes back and he calls his servants into account, and the one who has given five comes and reports that he's taken those five and he has five more to add to them. And the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. 
The one who was given two came, and he had also doubled his. He has two more. And he says to him, well done. But the one who had one went and hid it in the ground. And now he comes and says, see, I hid it. Now I dug it up. I knew that you were a hard man, that you uh, reap where you don't sow and all of that. And here is your money back. But the master said, you wicked and lazy servant. Now, <clears throat> I'd like you to notice that Christ's followers, that's you and me, have been redeemed for service. The Lord teaches that the true object of life is ministry. Christ himself came not to be waited on, but rather to work, and to all of his followers, he gives the law of service, service to God and service to their fellow man. And here Christ has presented a world, uh, to the world, a higher conception of life than they had ever known. By living to minister for others, man is brought into connection with God and the law of service becomes the connecting link which bonds us to God and to our fellow men. Therefore, the talents that Christ entrusts to his church represents especially the gifts and blessings uh, that are imparted by the Holy Spirit. I want to show you something, so hold your place here. We're coming back to Matthew 25, but turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul said to the church in Corinth, what he's saying to us starting in verse 8. For to one he gave the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So here we see that God knows you. He knows uh, what he has uh, designed for you to do, and he has given to each one according to their ability. And so each and every one of us has at least one talent. I had a sermon I think I gave uh, a while back, maybe a year or more ago, ago that was uh, on Andrew, a one-talent man, right? Right? But every time you hear about Andrew in the Bible, he's bringing someone to Jesus. That was his talent. That was his ability, right? Always bringing people to Jesus. We all have at least one talent, and some have more. I know some who have many talents. I wish that I had the talents they have. But we might ask the question, how much or how many talents have I received? But brothers and sisters, a better question is, what are you doing with the talents that God has given you? Amen? Because talents used are talents multiplied. Did you notice that? The one who was given five came with five more. The one who was given two came with two more. So if we put these two parables together, Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, we see that the ones who were given the talents doubled them. They were the ones who had more oil. Because as you put to work the skills, abilities, talents that God has given you, he multiplies them. You know the saying, don't you, that the more you use something, the better it is, right? Or the better you get at it. Because you're, you're 
putting that to use, and you are multiplying that skill and ability. So brothers and sisters, we can live successfully all the way to the end of time. How? By knowing what God wants us to do and doing it. And we see in these, in these parables that what God wants us to do is to, is to take uh, the, the testimony that we have and share it with others. The knowledge that we have of the Bible and share it with others. God didn't save you just to save you. He saved you so that he can use you to bring others into his kingdom as well. And that's why those who put to work what they had multiplied it and were considered faithful stewards, successful living in the end of time. And then you have the third parable. And how does the story end? It ends with the coming of the master and dividing the sheep and the goats. To those who had used what they had been given and used it to further the kingdom of God, they were uh, on the right hand, and he said, welcome into the everlasting kingdom and into the joy of your Lord. And to those who didn't, like the, the one who took the one talent and hid it in the ground, remember the ten virgins, those who didn't have the oil, those who hadn't multiplied it, those that didn't put to work the things that God had given them to do, and hid it in the ground, he, they were left outside. He said, I don't know you. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but those are the scariest words to me in all of Scripture. Where Paul said himself that he was concerned that ever, after having preached to others that he himself would be lost. That should be the concern of all of us, right? That, that we have that living connection with Jesus and, and that he says, yes, I know you, come on in. That we have that oil that is needed. And so uh, I want you to notice, go back with me to Matthew 25 and look with me starting in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison? prison and come to you. And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Here we see that Jesus is saying, these are the things I want you to do, and the good and faithful servant will be doing those things. Successful living in the end of time. Amen knowing what God wants us to do and doing it. Now, here's the problem that many of us have. When we look at the stories of the Bible, we always look at those things literally. And we look at those and we say, oh, I got to feed the, the hungry. Oh, I got to give thirsty, I got to give water to the thirsty. I've got to give, uh, visit those in prison. And we make the same mistake that Nicodemus and the woman at the well did. We look at those things physically. Now, I don't want to take away from that. Those things are important. But Jesus said, you're always going to have the poor. You're always going to have the hungry, the thirsty. And so we have to get in the habit of when we're looking at Scripture, we're looking at it with our spiritual glasses on. Amen? Because those things are important, those physical things. And there are groups of people, groups of Christians that do those things well, like the Salvation Army, right? But Ellen White has told us 
that we are to leave the physical things to them. We have a more important ministry. So when we look at those things, when he says, you gave to me when I was hungry, brothers and sisters, I will tell you that there are souls that are out there that are perishing because they're hungering for the word of God and we're not giving it to them. He says that you gave me water when I was thirsty, or you gave me something to drink. Just like Jesus told the woman at the well, I will give you living water, right? I will give you a, a, a truth that, that when you take that in, it will nourish your soul, and you will no longer thirst for the things of God. I was a stranger, and you took me in. And you gave me the Word of God. You gave me uh, a, a something that I didn't have, something I didn't understand. I was a stranger, but you brought me in and you called me brother. You called me sister. I was naked and you clothed me. You showed me that I don't have any righteousness of my own and I need the righteous garment of Christ if I'm going to get into the wedding supper of the Lamb. And, and it just keeps going on. I was sick and you healed me. Brothers and sisters, this world is sick with sin. And, and you brought me in and you gave me spiritual healing. You showed me the truth. You showed me that God has a plan for my life, that he loves me. I was in prison and you visited me. I was in the prison of sin and addiction. And you, you brought me this truth that brought me out of that kind of world. Jesus said, I came to bring you life and life more abundant. And you bring to people those spiritual truths and you help them to see that, that God has a plan for their lives. Physical things are important, but the spiritual things are far more important. I was hungry for the Word of God and you fed me. I was thirsting for righteousness and you gave me living water. I was a stranger and you took me in and you called me brother. You took me under your wing. I was naked and you showed me the righteousness of Christ. I was sick with sin and you showed me a better way. I was in prison. I was a slave to sin and addiction and you freed me. And so I ask you the question, why then would that one, that one servant take what the master had given him and hide it in the ground? Why do we do that? We know what God wants us to do. And in order to be successfully living at the end of time, we must not only know what he wants us to do, but we must be doing it. That is a powerful de definition of successful living. But why do people bury it in the ground? Well, they may be... They may be uh, yeah, they, they, they may be... Uh, their love has grown cold. Pride, laziness, discouragement, fear of rejection. Well, I can't preach, so he must not have called me. There are many reasons why we don't do what God has called us to do. Service for the Lord humbles us and helps us to see our dependence upon him. And that's the key to it. We need to realize that we can't save anyone, but that doesn't mean that we don't do what he's called us to do. And so normally, when we look at these parables individually and we drill down in them, we see a message for each one of them. But brothers and sisters, when we put all three of them together, what are we seeing? We're seeing the Laodicean message. And what is the message to the Laodiceans? You think that you are rich, but you are poor, blind, miserable, and naked. And we don't realize that even though we call ourselves a Christian, are we doing what God has called us to do? 
Do we have successful living in the end of time? Matthew 24 talks about the second coming and the signs that will precede it. Matthew 25 talks about what is important. How do we make sure that we're not deceived? The deception is today that you can just claim to be a Christian. You can say, yeah, my name is written in the book of life, and once saved, always saved, and I don't have to do anything. But brothers and sisters, the message of God is I have given you skills, I've given you talents, abilities, and I want you to put those to use, and as you do, I will multiply them. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm going to read the entire chapter. Verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, He covered His face. With two, He covered His feet. With two, He flew. And one cried to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, but yet a tenth will be in it, and will return and be for consuming, as a terebinth tree or as an oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. I want you to notice here that Isaiah has had a vision of God. And I want you to realize that Isaiah had already been sharing his faith. He had already been called as a prophet. We're into chapter 6 when he has this vision. So he is already, if we will, a part of the church, and he's already sharing a message with people around him. He is having successful living. Amen? He knows what God wants him to do, and he is doing it. But I want you to notice something that it says in the SDA Bible Commentary Volume 4, page 1139. It says this, Isaiah had denounced the sin of others, but now he sees himself exposed to the same condemnation he had pronounced upon them. He had been satisfied with a cold, lifeless ceremony in his worship of God. He had not known this until the vision was given to him of the Lord. That's pretty powerful. What it's saying is that Isaiah was a Christian. He was doing what God called him to do. He was pronouncing uh, a message to others, but now for the first time he sees the message also applies to him. 
You know, the Pharisees had the same problem. When Jesus asked them John's baptism, was it of men or of God, they wouldn't answer. Why? Because they themselves didn't think the message was for them. They thought it was for everybody else, right? And that's the Laodicean message. When we say that the Laodiceans are poor, pitiful, blind, and naked, we point to the church and we say, yeah, that's their problem. But the problem is me. The problem is us, right? The message from Jesus is I'm poor, miserable, blind, and naked. And that's the Laodicean message. And that's the message for our time. And so what happens? Isaiah has this vision of God, and for the first time, he sees in, in a clearer view the holiness of God, and he sees the depth of his own depravity. Woe is me, for I am undone, for I have seen the king. Amen? And so we see here that, that uh, Isaiah has had a, an experience with God. It, it, the, the commentary goes on to say, the vision given to Isaiah represents the condition of God's people in the last days. Is that you and me? Absolutely. This is a message for us. <clears throat> they are privileged to see by faith the work that is going forward in the heavenly sanctuary. And that's why you and I can think that we're rich and in need of nothing, because we have more understanding of Bible prophecy than any other denomination on the planet. We understand what's going on in the sanctuary right now and the, the judgment that is going on there. And so we can be proud in that, and we can think, oh, I'm saved, I don't need anything else, but God is telling us, no, you need to be working, because as you are working, I'm going to increase, I'm going to multiply, and you are going to be considered a true and faithful servant when I come, if I find you so doing, amen? Amen. Isaiah imagined himself in a righteous state before God. But when the glory of the Lord was revealed to him, he saw his true condition. Brothers and sisters, this is the same work that needs to be done in each of us. We need to understand the Laodicean message. We, we need to understand that God is talking to each one of us individually. And he's saying, I know your works. And I know that you say that you are rich and in need of nothing. I want you to notice what happened to Isaiah as soon as he had this vision. And he says, woe is me. We see the angel coming and touching his lips with a live coal we see him being given the righteousness of Christ. And he says, you're clean. We need that cleansing. Amen? And I want you to notice what happens as soon as he receives that cleansing. He says, here am I, Lord. Send me. Send me to my family. Send me to my neighbors. Send me to my co-workers. Send me to a mission, whether it's across the street or across the world. When we look into the heavenly sanctuary and we see the righteousness of God and we see our true miserable condition, we have a tendency to despair. We have a tendency to throw our hands up in the air and say, well, uh, maybe God can save me, maybe He can. But I want you to notice something that it said in the Review and Herald, December 22nd, 1896. But if we, speaking to us, if we, like Isaiah, will receive the impression the Lord designs shall be made upon the heart 
if we will humble our souls before God, there is hope for us. Isn't that good news, brothers and sisters? There is hope for us as we recognize our true condition, as we realize that we're not all that we thought that we were, as we realize that God still has more work to do in us, as we surrender our hearts to Him, there's hope for us. But notice, notice what God said to Isaiah. He said, you're going to go and you're going to talk to the people. Look at verse 9 again. He said, go and tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their eyes heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. What's God saying to you and me today? He's saying, this is what I want you to do, now go do it. That's successful living in the end of time. But he warns us ahead of time. You're going to go to these people and you're going to talk to them and they're not going to be changed by it. But keep going. You know, I don't see anywhere in Scripture where God holds us accountable for the results of the work. He only calls us accountable for doing the work. The results are up to Him. And so we cannot allow ourselves in these last days to be discouraged. We must keep on going. Keep sharing your faith. Keep giving your testimony. Because notice what He goes on to say in verse 11, he says, how long, O Lord, do you want me to do this? And what did he say? Until everything is laid waste. Keep going until Jesus comes. Keep going and keep sharing your faith. Why? Because verse 13, but yet a tenth will be in it. Brothers and sisters, there will be a remnant. Keep going. Keep sharing your faith. Don't be discouraged. And God will reward you as you are putting to use the things that He has given you to do. You will multiply your faith. You will multiply the character of Christ in you. And you will have success. There may not be a lot who will listen to you, but there will be a remnant. There's a promise of that. And He promises us, I have others who are not of this fold. And I must bring them in. And he will use you if you will let him. Is that the desire of your heart? You want to be used by Jesus for furthering his kingdom, for the hastening of the day of the coming of the Lord? If you do, won't you pray with me now? Oh, loving Father, what a powerful message as we are living in the time of Laodicea. And Lord, as we see there is a work that you are still doing in the world today, a work for those around us and a work for us. And Lord, it's not until we see how holy you are that we realize how sinful we are and how desperate we are for you. And Lord, when we see that and you have pronounced us clean, now, Lord, impress upon our heart to say to you, here am I, Lord, send me. And in the privacy of our hearts, we say it now. Lord, what would you have me do? We pray that you will show us, that you will use us, that you will multiply the skills and abilities that you've given us. And Lord, that we will be able to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. We pray for it in Jesus' name, amen.